Princeton University's Keller Center, educating leaders for a technology-driven society. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Welcome. Thank you for coming to this event. I'm Cornelia Holstrom. I'm the Associate Director of the Keller Center. I'm delighted to have our panelists with us today and our moderator. And this afternoon's talk is on building entrepreneurial ecosystems and it's sponsored by the Keller Center. So before I move on and introduce the panelists, I just want to say a few brief comments about Keller. The Keller Center was founded in 2005, and its broad mission is really to bridge technology and society, and to enable students through uh, curricular and co-curricular experiences to see how technology and society play together in the broadest context. Three areas that we're really interested in are entrepreneurship, innovation, and design. And today's topic obviously falls broadly in the entrepreneurship bucket. At the end of today's panel discussion, you're going to have the opportunity, opportunity to ask the panelists a series of questions at any time. Um, and after that, we have an informal reception out in the atrium. So please join us for that. I know there's some good, good food. The topic of today's panel discussion is extremely timely, especially in light of all the mushrooming, mushrooming of um, uh, interest in entrepreneurship and also in the increased number of communities and infrastructure to support entrepreneurs. So I think it's a really, really timely topic. Um, I feel really privileged to have our uh, panelists with us because they all have diverse backgrounds and can really speak and add to this conversation. The panel is moderated by Jim Fisher. Jim is a partner at Drinker, Biddle & Wreath, which is also a venture sponsor in the Keller Center's venture sponsorship program, so we're really grateful for that support. So Jim, Trey, Michael, and Wayne, uh, we're so grateful to have you here, and just join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you, Cornelia. Uh, let me first start by thanking the university again for giving us the space and the opportunity to speak about these events and, and this topic. Give uh, the gentlemen here a few minutes to introduce themselves. Let me introduce the topic first and foremost. We're here to talk about what we need to do to build an economic, or I'm sorry, an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And, and we're going to talk about it from a variety of different angles, both US, international, and, and some other sort of angles. So let me take a few minutes and, and let each of our panelists introduce themselves. We'll, of course, take your questions at the end, look forward to them. And we look forward to a robust uh, conversation. Great. Thanks, Jim. Sure. Uh, nice to see everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, I'm class of 92 from Princeton. Got to walk around campus today. Relive some memories. It's great to be back. Um, my background is kind of taking a winding road. Maybe all of us have. Um, I, I got interested in doing international work. Maybe I was started before I was here, but Princeton really helped um, trigger that specific interest. I spent three years in South Africa doing NGO work after um, Princeton, actually enabled by a Princeton grant initially to do some research in South Africa. This was right around the election time. I ran voter education programs for the elections in 94 when Mandela was elected. Um, I came back to the U.S. in 96. I have a joint um, MBA um, from Wharton and a Master's in International Affairs from Johns Hopkins. Um, I sort of worked at Internet 1.0 for AOL, although a little uh, too late to do as well as my AOL well <laughs> colleagues. Um, I was there before we merged with Time Warner in uh, 2001. My focus was um, expanding us into international markets. I worked on a joint venture with Lenovo, um, then called Legend to enter the China market. Um, sort of rose and fell with Time Warner and AOL. Interest, interesting ride. Um, then had done a lot of international business development for AOL and got into um, venture capital. I partnered with a um, an entrepreneur in, based in Israel, in Tel Aviv, and we set up a, um, a venture capital fund focused on investing in Israeli early stage medical device companies that had strong synergies with the Cleveland Clinic, where, where I moved back to. I'm from Cleveland originally. I know we have one former Clevelander in the crowd. Um, and I've uh, been running that fund, and then most, more recently, in addition to running my fund, uh, I've been teaching um, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial finance at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And then last year, I, I did a Fulbright Fellowship in um, Hanoi, Vietnam, where I taught entrepreneurship. And we'll talk more a little bit about some of my interest in international entrepreneurial ecosystem development. But thank you um, for having me today. Hi, I'm Wayne Tam. I'm currently the founder of Learn CS 101. It's a blended learning school in New York where we teach professionals how to code. So 
Uh, blended learning meaning we combine online curriculum with in-person instruction to reduce the cost of education and boost engagement. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was Chief Operating Officer of iMentor. It's a nonprofit organization in New York. Uh, we serve uh, 3,000 students uh, every year in para and, and mentorment team matches. Uh, so I did that for three years. Prior to that, uh, I spent eight years in financial services. Uh, after graduating here uh, in 01, I spent four years at Goldman Sachs and I spent four years at a hedge fund. Um, Oh, another thing I'm working on uh, that I've uh, done recently in the past year is start uh, the Princeton, um, found the Princeton Startup Collective. It's an informal incubator in New York. Um, we're focused on helping Princeton alums. Uh, in New York specifically, uh, something I observed being there for so long uh, is that there's not a lot of support uh, for um, Princeton alums starting new businesses and ventures on their own. And having been in an incubator myself, uh, fairly recently, I found that to be a great experience and wanted to share kind of the best practices with other alums in the city. So, thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Wayne. Trey? Uh, my name is Trey Bowles. I've never been to Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> and um, am, it is a pleasure to be here. You have an amazing, beautiful campus. We have many uh, beautiful campuses in the South. None of them are old, though. Hmm. So, it's nice to see um, buildings that seem historic. My background, similar to these guys, is a little all over the place. I started uh, in the internet in the mid to late 90s and started building businesses and did that for about 15 years in areas as such as tech, media, entertainment, television, film, music. Uh, and then I built several nonprofit companies as well kind of along the way, which sort of has brought me to where I am. Today, I always tell people that I, I find things that I am passionate about and figure out how to go do them. And so in 2010, after selling my last business, um, I live in Dallas, Texas, and so I started to sort of engage in entrepreneurship in Dallas. And if you're like most of the people I talk to in the country, entrepreneurship in Dallas are not words that are synonymous, <laughs> um, which is surprising because in Dallas, we think that everybody thinks that we're entrepreneurial. So. Um, in that process, ended up launching an entrepreneurship department at SMU, which is a university in Dallas. Uh, and then from there, launched a social entrepreneurship department, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, helped Steve Case, who launched uh, AOL, but Lyle also, Balls, yeah. pardon, your Lyle Lyle Balls, yeah. Yeah. Uh, launched uh, an initiative with the Coffin Foundation, the Case Foundation in the White House, called the Startup America Partnership. And so started to build a Texas branch as 30 other, 38 other states did as well. It was during that time I realized that people didn't think of Dallas as an entrepreneurial hub and I sort of set out to try to address that. And we have most recently launched in Dallas something called the Dallas Entrepreneur Center, um, which we call the DEC for short. And that launched in June and we're in the process of launching an entire entrepreneurial village in Dallas with the city that will incorporate hundreds to thousands of businesses in one central location to support building an ecosystem around entrepreneurship. So um, I am honored to be here and happy to be a part of the discussion. That's a, that's a great segue into sort of our, our overarching question or, or conversation piece. And what does it take to actually build an entrepreneurial ecosystem? But l l let's drill down for a second and ask sort of the first question. And, and let me just ask you to, to sort of take a tray and, and we'll work sort of towards Michael. Is, is an entrepreneurial ecosystem mandatory, required, important in order for you to have your own entrepreneurial success? I mean, how, how vital is it to, to an entrepreneur to be in one of these ecosystems? You know, my, my first response would be it's, it, that it's not mandatory, but it's inevitable because entrepreneurs just come together, right? The idea that like-minded individuals um, congregate and aggregate into, if, if it's not a geographical location, it is a virtual relationship because the idea of collaboration in today's entrepreneurial space is um, the rule, not the exception. I mean, I think that we have seen that uh, collaboration is more powerful than competition and in the long run it's more profitable. That does not mean there's, there's no longer competition, but what it does mean is we realize that um, as a rising tide raises all ships, that entrepreneurs who come together see more success both individually, collectively, and across the, the, the ecosystem. So um, 
So I don't mean to flip the question on you a little bit, but I, I don't I don't think that you have to be in an ecosystem to be successful. But I think it definitely helps. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would agree. I, mean, I don't think it's I don't think it's required. I don't think it's mandatory. I think it's one of many variables that go into entrepreneurial and and business success. I mean, there's so many. The first thing that comes to my mind when you start a business is not. Am I in the right city? It's mm -hmm. is my idea. You know, can I validate my business model? Is this a problem that that I can solve and create a solution that people will pay money for or donate money towards? So mm -hmm. that's not my first question. Is never the ecosystem. Am I in the right area? It is, of course, extremely helpful um, because it provides you mentorship opportunities, networking opportunities, um, just being in the in in as as Trey was saying, being immersed. With other entrepreneurs, it's very motivating, and, and there's a lot of uh, collaboration that goes on that is extremely helpful. But um, yeah, you can point to so many examples. You don't have to be in a Silicon Valley or uh, you know Silicon Alley or you know, Dallas, Einstein whatever the Dallas, Dallas is Einstein's Alley right. um, <laughs> to, to have to be you know, prime for entrepreneurial success. Michael, um, I'll, I'll differ a little. I mean, I think a lot of those comments are are ones that I would agree with. Um, when you think about kind of the the different pieces that fall into an entrepreneurial ecosystem, I mean, capital access to capital is one. It's not the only, and I think um, the fact is that most entrepreneurs that start their company statistically are doing it without raising equity capital. Um, I think we see whether it's globally or sort of locally. I mean, these sort of technology-based um, entrepreneurs that want to kind of grow quickly, have an idea, often will be looking to access outside capital, and I think. That's where, um, I mean, hey, ultimately in any community, whether it's Silicon Valley, New York, Dallas, Cleveland, um, you may be able to find pockets of capital, but I think like in a, in a community like Cleveland, where I'm from, I mean, in 2001, there was a study that McKinsey did. We were ranked 49th out of 50 in, in a number of different kind of metrics around entrepreneurship. So access to capital is one of them. And the, obviously there's other pieces that go into it in terms of sort of mentoring and you know, folks that have done it before, successfully started businesses, and then are looking to mentor and, and oftentimes deploy capital. So um, it's not always so when you're in, I think, communities where access to capital is a challenge, um, that is an important part of the ecosystem that may be missing because just kind of mentoring without capital um, can be a challenge. Let's take a step back for a second. So we. We've talked now for you know a couple of minutes about whether or not we need to, to be in one of these ecosystems. Maybe maybe the first question I should have asked is is what actually do you think constitutes an ecosystem? We obviously have you know several examples of, of what people around the world know as, as Silicon Valley and and, and some of, of the high profile ecosystems. But if you were to to think about building one, what would you view as as sort of your your building blocks? Clearly, capital being I think a place to start, but do you want to maybe? No, I mean, it's a good question. I and mean, I think that, you know, we may all have different definitions of the pieces. Um, I, I think this, this sort of broadly speaking, sort of mentoring, I mean, Ma Wayne was alluding to, um, you know, at the end of the day, how can sort of, whether it's a first time entrepreneur or a seasoned entrepreneur has an idea of validating that idea and testing those assumptions. And I know that the Keller Center program, you know, when there's folks that are doing going through the program. I mean, many of us, I think, started when we saw what Steve Blank was doing with kind of lean launch pad, and I know that's a class here. Um, I think Steve, in many ways, sort of hit upon something that a lot of us have believed for a long time, but elegantly sort of organized it in a way. It's like, hey, whether you're a researcher or an entrepreneur, you need to sort of go out and engage with customers. And I think you need people in an ecosystem that have sort of seen it done it and can sort of provide support along the way. So capital is one piece. I think sort of mentoring um, is another piece. I think access to ultimately those customers. And you know, it's interesting in every community because many times you might have an individual, like a corporate leader that's willing to, um, maybe they're an angel investor, maybe they're providing mentoring help. It's often hard for um, where commu our communities and leaders in the communities, do they become customers? Um, and it depends obviously on what the companies are, but um, we struggled a bit in Cleveland to sort of turn some of our corporate leaders into customers for our startup companies. Um, it's not necessarily a necessary aspect of the ecosystem, but I think kind of what is the role of your local corporate community um, in supporting your homegrown company? So those are some of the things. I mean, there may be other pieces of these guys. Wayne, can you give us your thoughts? Yeah. I. 
I've, I mean, I, I, I'm on this panel, so uh, the, this concept of, a, of an ecosystem has been, it's been in my mind, a lot, like I'm trying to define it in my mind, it's very vague, right, it, it, an entrepreneurial ecosystem, and I think what's interesting about today is that, I mean, a lot of people think about geography, but I think increasingly so much more than that is that we're so interconnected, even beyond, I mean, access to capital, yes, that might be a geographical limitation, or, you know, the people that you're in New York City, so you're just closer, but with abilities to crowdfund, with abilities to connect uh, over the internet and other ways that aren't geographically limited, I think this concept of an entrepreneurial ecosystem is a, it's a little bit of a false premise because you can globally contact people for mentorship, for advice, for, fi for financing and you know, testing and validating your assumptions in so many other ways than, than just being in a certain city in a certain place. Um, so that's why I struggle with the concept of an entrepreneurial ecosystem, broadly speaking. Um, but I do, I mean, and maybe it's being in New York that I take it for granted that I do, that in New York City, yes, I mean, so many, because you're, uh, depending on the industry you're in, um, so you have access to so many more resources, people, uh, capital, particularly, um, and, and if you're in the in, just in if you're in the verticals that your geography specializes in, it gives you such a um, leg up over other uh, folks in other. You know, so it's kind of a it's kind of a mixed bag. I, 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 it's hard for me to define, but um, so maybe I'll leave that to Trey. Well, no, <laughs> I mean, I think there's a I think some of what you guys said makes a lot of sense. I think, uh, and you kind of touched on this. Um, sort of around the outside, but what I would say is access to talent being one mm. of those, right? Because um, without without real talent, you can't have good workers. Without good workers, you can't make, you know, you can't grow, you can't scale. So access to talent is a big one, and one that I think Silicon Valley specifically prides itself on. I, I personally believe that there uh, there is a difference between uh, experienced entrepreneurial talent versus just being uh, like subject matter expertise. Mm. And, and uh, you can't replace experience and you can't pay you can't pay for experience right but you, um, you you can just live through it but there's extremely accomplished established subject matter experts across the country in every different city or ecosystem that have to be there and have to be present um, in addition to that I think the educational system in a sort of geographical area is important because you have to be you have to be attracting smart kids that will turn into good talent over time and so um, and I think that's one thing I think having you know tier one research centers and some really you know powerful education systems there is great in, in Dallas where I live we've got a lot of really great universities but no tier one research centers and so we're sort of figuring out how do we how do we attract you know um, computer science you know engineers how do we attract some of these people so what do we what do we do in Texas? But we just go try to find them outside the country and hmm. figure out how we're going to make that happen. Which is, which is, you know, being creative in your own way. But talent's a big one. I think, you know, and there's a great book uh, that one of our friends wrote, uh, Brad Feld, called Startup Communities. Mm -hmm. Some people like it, some don't, some people don't. I think, I think it says a lot about what people who have been and tried to build um, startup communities and ecosystems actually think. He sort of sort of codified it and put it into words and and part of that too is is remembering that no one runs an ecosystem there's not a president a general mm -hmm. manager or a mayor um, and that you have to bring in people of all types um, with different experience levels with different ideas even when you don't think that it's uh, it's helpful often we talk in Dallas about the unfortunate distractions that come along that prevent us from moving forward but sometimes those distractions are important uh, so bringing so I do think um, bringing those together important the capital piece is one that is difficult because even in a place like Dallas where I live where there is 25 billionaires right there's more money in Texas than in most countries in the world but none of it is going into the startup community mm -hmm. so having all the money in the world doesn't really help you if it's not investing in startups so we're having to go through this process of education mm -hmm. of outreach of engagement um, and where does that come from? That comes from good deals, right? People always say, if you have a good deal, it'll get funded. Um, and so we have to do a better job of educating and preparing these, these 
you know, young entrepreneurs to actually build businesses that work. We often talk about removing the obstacles that stand in their way from actually launching their business. So often you fail in a startup not because your idea is bad, but because you didn't properly project cash flows, or as Jim was talking about earlier, you sign a, you know, a really bad partnership agreement with somebody that you you break up with three months in, you know, into the into the beginning of the company. So those sorts of things I think are additional pieces that sort of aid to creating an import, uh, you know, a successful ecosystem, but you have to have um, those pieces together in some capacity. And you're gonna have, it's gonna be like anything, you're gonna have one that's, that's higher and one that's lower. I don't hear anybody in any city talking about how there's too much money going around to invest in startups. <laughs> um, so we could always use more capital, but, uh, but I also think that you know, each ecosystem is unique and we need to figure out how we, inside of those ecosystems, um, help support, build, and grow our startups to a place where they have the ability to have access to that, those kind of resources. But let me stay with, with Brad's book for a minute because well, one of the opening lines, if I recall, is, is something to the effect of the, you know, the investigation into startup communities is, is one of the most important questions you know, of our day or of our time. But you agree with that? I mean, I think... I, I really like Brad. Brad's an advisor to the Dallas Entrepreneur Center. So I also think he's selling books, too. So that's, that's a pretty bold <laughs> statement. But I do think it's important because I do think specifically in his experience, and he's, from, he's a guy from Dallas, moved to Boulder, and has truly created a community of, um, of chance and trying and people setting out and doing new things. And he is the king of supporting it, hmm. you know, and really encouraging it. So... You know, I think the investigation into you know, why and how startup communities are created is essential. And I think that um, these startup communities are really important to the success of the, of the companies that exist. I mean, in our space alone, um, the, the most amazing entrepreneurial interaction that we see is when, when two people walk up to the water fountain at the same time and one guy looks at a girl and says, so what do you do? Oh, I'm working on this. Oh, I'm working on this. And the next thing you know, they sit down for two hours and they're helping each other mm. build, build a business. Um, so that's, that's interesting. I also think there is an element of trendiness and sort of fad to the startup ecosystems now. And I think the fact that cities, municipalities are putting huge amounts of money into um, startup scenes as an economic development piece is really, really great. I don't think in the long run it, it sustains itself like that. But, but I do think, you know, fr from Brad's perspective, um, the investigation piece and really the explanation behind and sort of the processing behind what does, what has made these different geographical ecosystems or locations work mm -hmm. and what are elements that help feed into a stronger um, ecosystem is a very powerful, important question. Wayne, uh, Mike, um, I have a couple. I mean, a couple of thoughts. I mean, in his book, that's a, this is a great. I mean, it's a, sort of a must read on the book, right. and it's a it's a quick read too. Um, you know, he and one of our panelists was talking about. You know, I think it was. Um, um, I think it was Trey was talking about. You know, Brad says. You know, the the driver of entrepreneurship could be anyone in a community. In his book, he's very kind of pessimistic or takes sort of a um, skeptical eye towards the role of government and takes a skeptical eye towards the role of um, what I call sort of intermediary organizations, NGOs that sort of form in communities to kind of help, you know, again, there's sort of no, you know, Brad's like, hey, there's no one leader. So if somebody tries to sort of come in a community and it's like, hey, we're going to be running everything that that that's not the way it's to sort of love. Our experience in Cleveland has been a little bit different. Um, and, and you know maybe when you take the training wheels off, some of these things can happen. So we've had this sort of unprecedented, even kind of like in the US, we have a $2.3 billion state of Ohio program, something called the Third Frontier, which to the credit of a Republican governor who put it in place um, over 10 years ago, I mean, it, was, it had, a, it had a, um, a time horizon beyond the second, what would have been the second term of his administration, which is like, I mean, particularly in these political times, like anybody doing anything that's beyond, I mean, we can't agree on something for like tomorrow. Um, 
So his name was Bob Tapp, he's a Republican governor. Then that program, and that was a program focused on um, dollars really to, for commercialization. So some of it, we have some pretty good federal research dollars coming into universities like Case Western Reserve. So that program was looking at like which sectors, you know, medical is one that we took, you know, take advantage of. So, and it's, it was sort of a long-term play. But, you know, states can't, direct, they don't do historically a very good job of like deploying, picking winners of private companies. So we, we form a number of intermediary organizations, NGOs that set up different funds and different programs to basically kind of distribute money ultimately to entrepreneurs. That program was then carried on by a Democratic governor who had, was he one term? I think he was a one termer. Um, so we're, yeah, so we're sort of 12 years in. Now we have another Republican governor and like, hey, he's like, that wasn't my program. Um, and he's like, not sure we want to continue with this. You know, and, and whether, and this is a normal political process where like, you know, sort of not invented here, does, in, you know, should this program be continued? You know, so we've created like in, so, so the role of government like in Ohio and the amount of capital that's been put in, and I'm not saying it's been like necessarily the most efficiently used in all of its manifestations, but we like in Ohio, for example, like seed acceleration, we fund the 25,000, we have a $25,000 grant that comes from the state of Ohio that gets matched with donor or private money. So for the $50,000 that goes into seed accelerator, half of it is from government. In Silicon Valley, or I'm sure kind of in New York, like you don't need, like the state of Ohio, the state of California isn't funding Y Combinator, but we do it in Ohio. So, you know, it, there may be things that like the role of government can play. The other interesting thing that we have in Ohio is we've had the foundation community and philanthropy that like traditionally had supported like the art museum and the Cleveland Orchestra decided to get behind economic development. So we have these like additional resources that are coming in. And it's interesting, like as I read Brad's book, um, and he, he has a skeptical eye, and there's every reason to sort of be like, hey, government may not be like the perfect mechanism. But I think government has a place to play in this, and it can be important at a state and local level. But he, but he encourages the involvement of the university, though. Right. Which is, which is interesting, because universities are great, but they're not always, not always known for corporately being the most innovative thinking bodies that exist. Mm. So... Um, but we, I mean, we've done the same thing in Texas. We have the Texas, Texas Emerging Tech Fund, and it is flopped on its face mm. because nobody was there to manage the business side of it. Nobody was there to manage the investments once they were made. And so, was it lot, state money that went into that? State money. Okay. And then, you know, and then as I said, in the city of Dallas, they're building an entrepreneurial village that that they're coming in and they're going to put money into. The the problem is, and it sounds like Cleveland or it sounds like Ohio is doing a great job, but you know. In Dallas, he's, the city's going to come in and build this huge village, and they haven't asked anybody that's an entrepreneur what they need or how to do it. So, hmm. you know, there's no, there's pros and cons. Sounds, I, and it sounds so like Ohio's doing great, though. That's Texas. We've, we're still learning. Hmm. So before we, we sort of move off of the concept of, of geography and ecosystems, because I do want to get to a few other points that, that touch on different types of ecosystems, as I'm sure our, our audience does Mike, t tell us a little bit about, if you can, what do you see as differences between sort of key U.S. ecosystems versus, you know, perhaps an ecosystem overseas? Sure, sure. So that, that's a topic that I'm passionate about and interested in. So I had the opportunity, I mentioned in my intro, I spent um, eight months of last year in um, Vietnam where I was teaching. I, I did a Fulbright um, fellowship, which is interesting because I had Prince and Friends that did that after like the student Fulbright. And I was like... I didn't even know you could do it as a professor. It was great. I mean, it was such an amazing, I took my family and it was an amazing opportunity. I was asked by, um, within their Ministry of Science and Technology, they had a, um, an agency sort of focused, almost like in Ohio, it's like our Department of Development. They were trying to figure out how could, I mean, at the end of the day, it's job creation, it's stemming brain drain. It's all the things that like all of our communities sort of care about. I mean, New York kind of went through it. I mean, it's sort of amazing to look at New York now and kind of where they were economically, sort of even 25 years ago. Um, there are a lot of people running around. I mean, everybody wants Silicon Valley at this point. So it's like a fully functioning private sector funded sort of ecosystem. Um, and, and my experience, and I've given a little bit of background on kind of what we're seeing in Ohio, like there was just a tremendous amount of interest in what, um, how the role of sort of government and then broadly speaking, sort of philanthropy. And in, in an international context, it might be the U.S. government through USAID. It might be the World Bank. Um, funding entrepreneurship. So there's, you know, not surprisingly, given some of the excess in the U.S. of um, seed accelerators, there's like, you can't throw a stone overseas 
and not hit a seat accelerator in Istanbul or Cape Town or somewhere. So they're looking at some of these models and many of them, um, these models are also relying on, so some of it's sort of corporate support. Google's been supportive in some emerging markets as well, but it's really this combination of like government um, philanthropy, broadly speaking, and the private sector coming together. Because I think when people look at Silicon Valley or even to some degree kind of where New York is today, maybe it's not as relevant. Like in Ohio, as an example, like on angel investing. So we, and it, it, it sounds sort of probably weird to like communities outside where, where angel networks like function in the private sector. Like we subsidize our angel networks through this third frontier program. So there's actually dollars that go into um, incenting angel funds to form with the idea that like that can help spur um, high net worth individuals who like, and we have a number in Cleveland who don't invest in the scene. In markets like Vietnam, I mean, you've got wealth, but there's like no tradition of investing outside the family. So a friend of mine was like setting up Vietnam's first angel network and like they haven't made an investment yet. And so I think there's some interesting um, sharing to be done, um, broadly speaking, and, and, and international markets look different. So some of it is access to capital. Like you just, they really struggle entrepreneurs to get outside, like once they, and actually social entrepreneurship is a really interesting topic in international markets as well. Actually, my advice, I did some lecturing in Laos and Cambodia and Burma, and my basically my takeaway was to the entrepreneurs, and it sounds a little crass, I was like, figure out how you can be a social business, because that's where the money is, to, to fund what you're doing, which, um, and it turns out many of them are doing, you know, what, to, I didn't mean to, if they were doing something that has no social impact, but, um, there's a lot of money and interest in sort of social entrepreneurship overseas. So I've been really energized by what I've seen kind of outside the U.S. And every, everybody's doing it a little bit differently. Before we get to, to social entrepreneurship, l let's just ask this question. Do you see a distinction between the emerging world and the, let me just call it the, you know, sort of the Western European world in terms of the types of ecosystems they're developing? Uh, aside from the notion of, of what they would invest in or, or the types of investments that they would make, are there things that are unique about ecosystems in each of those sort of geographies that make them perhaps uh, more attainable or less attainable for the, for the for formation, I guess, of an ecosystem? Nick, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I will add to whatever you No, no, go ahead. If you've seen other markets. Well, I mean, I think it just depends on I mean, I think depends on the in the the country and where they are in terms of their development, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, London has an extremely sophisticated ecosystem, and from a technology perspective, and everybody from, you know, everybody involved in, in leadership in the community is supporting it, and it's thriving. It's huge. Well, it's London, right? So, um, I would imagine that areas in Uganda and you know. Somalia and developing countries probably don't have the same focus of, of opportunity or real economic development. Having said that, the whole movement of micro lending and microfinance is built around empowering entrepreneurship within you know developing countries with the with the purpose of empowering people to give them the ability to equip them to be able to build their own businesses and pay for their kids to go to school and pay for you know all the expenses that they have and even save money. Um, the interesting side of, of microfinance, though, is that you, you would never go into a room like this or into any space in the world and assume that everybody in the room is an entrepreneur. But that's kind of what they do in these mm -hmm. developing uh, countries, par partially out of necessity um, because, uh, you know, there's just, there's not as many people, there's not as much opportunity, so you kind of just start your own thing. I'm, I'm going to be the one that owns the chickens, I'm going to be the one that owns the the horse, and then I'm going to be the one that has the bicycle that rides to other buildings, you know, the, that sorts of things. But um, so I, I would say, you know, at least from my experience, that it, it's a big depender on the development of the country in terms of how sophisticated that ecosystem is. But I think even at, you know, third world countries and in, in the in the smallest of villages, there's people getting in there and and building and teaching people how to be entrepreneurs in, in their own sort of an ecosystem. And because of the way the loans are given in a lot of cases, um, they're given at a village level. So um, if there's 25 of us in a village and 25 of us get a $100 loan, if one of us doesn't pay back our loan, there is not another loan to the village. So the community has to pull together and pay back the loan if somebody can't do it or the community suffers, which is a really interesting model. And obviously they're their payback rates are 
substantially higher than loans in the U.S. But um, but that, so I think it's exciting to see entrepreneurial entrepreneurship and ecosystems take different forms in different parts of the world, based on the need. I'll make just one quick comment, just on risk to, risk tolerance. At least what I see in the U.S. versus other markets. So. Um, and, and some of this is actually on a political level and on an individual level. I mean, many of my students in Vietnam, I mean, it's a tremendous, I don't know if people, I mean, are from other parts of the world or travel, I mean, you go outside your, I mean, it's an incredibly entrepreneurial economy where lots of people smelling, selling small things. I think many government, when we talk, I mean, when we talk about entrepreneurship, when we talk about sort of high growth, maybe technology-based entrepreneurship, I think that's where some of these markets struggle. Um, and, and, and that's where a lot of the job creation can be. It's not, Many of my students that I taught, like it's you know they we I would do some business plan kind of stuff in class, and they'd be like, oh, let's open up another restaurant or something. I'm like, you know, does Hanoi really need another pho? You know, what what how could you supply? What technology could you supply to the people doing that? And when you really unravel, and and this is and it happens in a lot of places outside the U.S. I mean, this tolerance for like, you know, is failure okay? And um, and it's not necessarily, I mean, I think we embrace failure as communities, arguably, in the U.S. in a much deeper way than in other markets. So I think that's, that fear of failure sometimes drives people to, like, not get out of their comfort zone. Um, Wayne, let me, let me ask you this question. You live in, in New York, uh, which is a large, obviously, ecosystem of itself and obviously Silicon Valley and others uh, are similarly situated. How do you sustain an ecosystem? How do we make sure that the Clevelands, the Boulders, you know, the, the, the Dallases, how do they sustain what they're trying to build? I mean, hmm, it's an interesting question. I, I think, I don't know, I mean, based on the comments that we've already heard, I feel like at some point you gain escape velocity, right? Like I feel like New York has that you don't need, I mean, Bloomberg's done a lot, arguably a lot to support um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem in New York, bringing, um, uh, supporting, you know, all like different hackathons, app contests, things like that. Education is a huge, uh, he's supported a ton of um, uh, large uh, education support um, and really trying to build New York, build New York as kind of the second coming of, of uh, Silicon Valley. Um, so you see a lot of government support, but I feel like New York as itself, given its diversity, given all the things that we've talked about being s essential for uh, an entrepreneurial ecosystem, capital, talent, uh, you know, uh, di diversity of ideas and people, it's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of self-fulfilling and becomes an, a, an interesting and um, exciting enough place for people to congregate and, and view this as a place to start a business. Um, if you don't have that, I mean, if you don't have that escape philosophy, you don't have that kind of self-fulfilling community, you have situations, you know, this is the things that, that uh, Trey and, and Jim are working on. Um, how do you get that escape philosophy be self-sufficient? Well, don't you think, I mean, I think part of the problem with a lot of the country is that we all, and, and maybe we don't, maybe we don't want to be Silicon Valley, but we want to aspire to the success that Silicon Valley has. And so one of the things that I've sort of been championing inside of our ecosystem is let's figure out what makes Dallas work and what makes Dallas s sustainable and different. Um, and let's embrace that. And if we begin to embrace that, which for us, and uh, Michael mentioned this earlier, is we have 18 Fortune 500 companies headquartered in Dallas. I mean, Dallas is, is known for sort of big business. And so how do we integrate the startup community with the corporate community in the form of vendor relationships or potential acquisitions or outsource innovation or even investment. So first let's figure out what that sustainable model is for that individual area and, and be okay with the fact that you're not going to look exactly like Silicon Valley or you're not going to look like New York. I mean Dallas is this sprawling, you know, geographic, huge geographical region. If you look at San Francisco, it's 46 square miles and Dallas is 9,000 square miles. So you can't build the same kind of ecosystem um, that in New York as you could there. And then second of all, and, and, and Michael uh, mentioned this earlier, the entrepreneurs that succeed have to plug back in to the ecosystem and fund future entrepreneurs. And they have to mentor future entrepreneurs. And we see this in Dallas most recently through a company called SoftLayer, which does cloud computing, hosting, and whatnot. 
sold for two billion dollars to um, IBM about four or five months ago. Um, five, five entrepreneurs started in 2005, sold their company in 2013. That's a pretty good return on time and investment, but they're plugging back into the ecosystem. They're creating ways to support those people, put money back in. I think in terms of sustaining an ecosystem, those are a couple of the things that come to my mind that would be, at least for us, is going to be really essential to um, moving the needle, if you will. So in a place like Dallas, where you have 18 Fortune 500 companies, how has, how has sort of the, the corporate venture capital model impacted an ecosystem? Uh, I would imagine it's had quite an impact, especially in an area like Dallas. You know, they're, they're learning. Um, they're, you know, I, I, in some cases they launch venture arms, so 7-Eleven. Do you guys have 7-Elevens up here? 7-Eleven launched its own venture arm. Um, AT&T built these uh, facilities called the Foundry, and they've got one in Dallas, one in Tel Aviv, one in um, Silicon Valley, and maybe one other space, trying to help create innovation kind of outside their organization, but still run underneath their organization. Um, Pepsi and Dr. Pepper and places like that all have corp uh, global innovation officers. I don't think they're doing quite enough um, I don't think they know what to do, but they know that they need to be doing something. And in some cases, their answer is, "Well, let's go to, let's go to Redmond or Palo Alto mm -hmm. and look and see what they're doing, and let's invest money there." But the reality is, and what we've sort of championed, championed inside the community and challenged them to do is, as corporations, there's all kinds of problems that they have, right? All kinds of issues they have to deal with. Whether that's we really don't know how to affect this supply chain line logistically to we have 6,000 patents and we really aren't leveraging them to their full degree so we're going to them and saying why don't you just take a couple of these problems we'll bring in a bunch of people you tell them what the problem is and see if they can go solve it because you know you can't effectively do it with your current staff so the example I use is 7-Eleven came to us six months ago and said Amazon just launched this new company. We really don't want to pay Amazon to do this. So this is exactly what we would fund if somebody went out and built it. Two and a half hours later, we came back to them with a complete business plan and strategy with the, the logistics set up in China to actually develop the pieces that they wanted to. And they said, okay, sure, we'll fund that, right? So I don't think it's nearly as challenging as people think that it is. Some of these problems from an entrepreneurial perspective um, just can't be solved at a corporate level because they're just too big, moving the Titanic's too hard, whereas these entrepreneurs are small, they're, they're, they're nimble, they're, they're on the cutting edge of technology and what's available. And so I think that in, in Dallas we're moving in that direction, and I think the way you do it is you make it palpable to them financially. Um, I think you know, one of the biggest problems that, that we have or that I have being uh, you know, a lifelong startup guy is I don't speak corporate well. Hmm. And so you could be saying the exact same things, but it isn't said and packaged in the way that they understand it, and so they, they don't think it's their solution at all. So there's a lot of pieces there, but I think that is what will differentiate Dallas long term. I think when you start to think about what makes somebody move to a Cleveland or a Dallas or wherever to start their business, it can't just be because it's a great place to live, because I'm sure that it is. It's got to be substantive value. And if we can get AT&T and ExxonMobil and JCPenney and Neiman Marks, whoever it is in Dallas that are these Fortune 500 companies that will actually start doing business with startups, then people will move from across the country, from across the world to your city because they think it gives them a better chance to be successful. I mean, look at Walmart in Bentonville, Arkansas, right? I mean, part of the reason people go there because they want to, and part, on the other side, Walmart says, this is where the shopping center is with all the offices. If you want to do business with us, call the real estate agent and get an office and put somebody here all the time. Well, they've got an exorbitant amount of buying power, which gives them the ability to do that. But I think um, there's something to that, being in that vicinity and being right down the street as opposed to across the country or across the world. I want to make sure we have enough time for, for questions. So let me move away from geography and to, to other forms of, of ecosystems. Uh, Michael, you mentioned social ecosystems, and, and Trey, I know it's, it's something that is near and dear to you. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. What, when, when we use the phrase social, uh, e social entrepreneurial ecosystems, what do we mean? 
I asked, it's funny, I said I asked Trey before, I'm like, how do you define it? Um, Because I think people, it's a pretty broad umbrella. Um, You know, like in, we've talked a lot of like in, a lot of our efforts are in Cleveland around what I would call sort of broadly speaking kind of economic development. So I run a venture capital fund. Um, Part of the, our pitch to investors, there was a return on investment proposition, but also we were bringing Israeli companies to commercialize their technology in Cleveland. So like ultimately job creation. And that was a big part of why our LPs invested. You know, is that social entrepreneurship? Maybe, I mean, you know, I think once you brought, once you sort of broaden the definition around kind of economic development, because I think when I think of, I mean, just because you're not saving, I mean, there's, I think there's a number of traditional definitions of, of entities that were focused on Maybe it'd be rural employment. Maybe it'd be focused on you know women entrepreneurs. Maybe it'd be something on the environment. I'm beginning to see like a much bigger umbrella under which you know, and, and again in our I think in our um, community, economic development falls under. So it's an interesting like I don't I think everybody may may answer it a little differently. Yeah, no, I mean I think a lot of people view social entrepreneurship as synonymous with nonprofits. I mean I think that's traditionally where it came from because. Nonprofits, and they don't have. There's no equity shareholders. There's no shareholder. It's you're reporting to your donor base and your board. Um, but I think increasingly so, you see a convergence of both for-profit and nonprofit moving towards a social mission. I feel like, it's particularly, I don't know. I mean, I, I worked a nonprofit for three years after being the most non-socially uh, <laughs> impactful <laughs> industry, financial services for so long. And it was, it, was such a, it was such a different mindset in terms of why we're doing the work we're doing and attracts people uh, who aren't motivated by, you know, for, for, mm-hmm. for, from a pure profit motive. But I feel as though both, both ends of the spectrum have a lot to learn from each other and moving towards the center. You see so many companies I mean, from you know Warby Parker, every every it's a it's a they sell uh, eyeglassware over the web. They donate you know a pair of glasses for every one that you buy as a customer, right? You see um, a lot of ed- education technology companies. You see a lot of health tech companies having a very strong social uh, social mission attached with uh, their a core set, a, a core tenant of their business uh, in the, of their actual existence is that they have this mission to educate you know, K through 12, or to get kids into college, or to get kids jobs after college. I mean, um, the whole, you see so many more businesses using this, um, not only as a, as a means for existence, literally that's why it exists, but for motivational purposes for really driving um, the business forward and proving that it's not just profit, but it's, it's both. And it brings meaning to uh, the work that they do and the customers that they serve. Um, so I feel like in terms of supporting these, both of these supporting social entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurship, it's not that different. It's in fact, I don't think it's any different from um, for-profit entrepreneurs. I mean, for for I guess non-socially impactful uh, entrepreneurs, I don't think anyone who's an entrepreneur would think they're not. They don't have a social impact. But I don't think the ecosystem, the support, and the services, and the mentoring, um, the advice, the capital, all that stuff um, is very. You see very strong analogs with the four profit world. And it's interesting because you're seeing sort of that convergence, right, with the notion of, of B corporations that Absolutely. are sprouting up all over yes. the place, including in, in the state of New Jersey. So I think you'll, you'll probably continue to see that uh, grow and, and morph a little bit and, and sort of come together. You have, you have some thoughts you want to offer on this sure. chart? Well, I mean, I, I echo what both of you guys said. I mean, I tell people that, that specifically in my classes that um, that the problem is that you don't have to be a nonprofit to, to create or perpetuate a social good. In fact, I want you to prove to me why you should be a nonprofit because nonprofit models tend to just not work as well, right? When you're in a for profit model and you do a bad job, you get fired. When you're in a for profit model and you don't run your business well, it runs out of business. When you're in a nonprofit, you can go raise money, you hire your you know, cousin to do your graphic design, whatever it may be but it tends to be a less effective and efficient model in some cases, I'm stereotyping. Um, having said that, what's wrong with making money and doing good? So social entrepreneurship is strictly entrepreneurship with um, a focus on the mission being paramount. Now that in and of itself is flawed too because at some point you will hit a sp- space where they are not equal. 
you cannot always have the mission equal to the um, profit focus because you've got, you've got to make a decision that's going to keep you in business or not keep you in business. But what we're trying to do with these students is talk to them about the idea of social injustice, the, the, the responsibility and opportunity that they have to give back to people in need and how do they do that. And so there's this wide spectrum. We've talked a little bit of about it, whether it's on one side it's nonprofit, on the far other side it's for profit. You've got social businesses, social enterprises, social entrepreneurship, corporate social responsibility, which is what a lot of the corporations do. But ultimately, how are we teaching these students the importance of perpetuating some sort of good regardless of where they, where they fall on the spectrum. And we live in a different age now than we did even than when I graduated college in that kids are gonna have 20 jobs in their lifetime now. And so what that does is that, is that gives them the freedom to um, embrace and try different things, to go out and see what do they like and really focus on not well, I've got to take this job to get me in this place to do this, to get me this wife, to get me this house, to get me this um, you know, retirement plan, because they're not going to have that. They no longer can put their identity in their VP level job, um, if you think about American Psycho, um, with the different cards that people pull out. But rather, it's going to be about what do they care about, what makes them different. And you're seeing this, and I'm sure you're seeing this here at Princeton, just like we do at SMU, is these kids are passionate about people that are that need help and they want to go help them and they don't see any reason why they can't. So social entrepreneurship, you know, in the traditional sense is sort of this triple bottom line approach to profit people and planet. And um, as much as I think it's important to, to uh, sustain the planet, I don't think that those are essential elements to build a, a social enterprise model or social entrepreneurship model. I mean, even I was teaching class for, in the business school the other day and they said, well, what if you just hire a lot of people? Isn't that socially responsible? I mean, isn't that good? You're creating jobs, and so you're right. It is expanding outside of what um, it's traditionally been thought of, the Muhammad Yunus model of uh, the Grameen Bank, the microfinance model, the Grameen Danone model where he went into Bangladesh. And I, I like the idea of it is because it forces um, traditional nonprofits and traditional do-good organizations to be innovative and to think outside the box and to not be constrained to the... Um, the traditional approach to um, how we raise money and donations. Now, on the other side, we now think that sustainability for a nonprofit means we should make t-shirts and sell them, which is not necessarily the right answer either, but we're moving in the right direction. And so, um, you know, to, to what you guys have said before, I think it's the responsibility of any business, anybody, regardless of what business they're in, whether they own their own business or they work at Starbucks, uh, or they work for PepsiCo, that they should be focused on some sort of social good that they want to perpetuate, which could be hiring people, which could be, you know, curing disease in Africa, could be, you know, helping the homeless in your own city, whatever that may be. I think that needs to be a priority of what, what builds who we are and ultimately builds our reputation over the long haul. So let me pause. Been very gracious with your time. And, and ask the audience if they have any questions for our, for our panelists. Please. Sure. Um, in the context of Latin America, I'd like uh, to see if uh, maybe uh, you have uh, uh, experience considering that sometimes uh, the government participation is very high, so most of the young people are looking uh, are land seekers, so they try and like uh, use this instead of like uh, going uh, in the private sector and starting their own businesses. Um, how do you think effectively this thing? Because a lot of uh, innovation is there, but you don't see it happen for, for many years. So I don't think it's the government controls if, uh, what it is, and if we can elaborate on, on this specific sure. context. I, can, I, mean, I, can, I haven't worked, had the opportunity to work in Latin America, but um, you know, it's interesting given what a political reality may be in a particular country. Um, I mean, I was in Turkey this summer, I taught at a business school in Ankara, and I heard a lot of um, negative feedback about, I mean, government was playing an active role, and, and, and I think your question may be broader than kind of the, the government's role in entrepreneurship in particular, but I'll focus on that. Um, some of these programs were sort of set up where they were providing early stage opportunities, and it was fairly like easy to get some of these government grants, but like the government programs weren't necessarily so well aligned to help entrepreneurs along the way. 
I think oftentimes in, um, one of the things we try to do in Ohio that was kind of interesting and somewhat innovative was the, um, there were third party um, organizations that got contracted to make decisions on some of the grants. So it wasn't actually like a government official um, that was gonna give the, making a decision on a grant just because oftentimes governments, they're not well suited to pick winners on this sort of business sense. So that, I know when I was in Vietnam, just given some of the challenges around cronyism and corruption, like there was a lot of interest there, and sort of almost like fascination. And again, this isn't to like single out Vietnam in particular, but like in many countries around the world, government grants may be given or government support may be given built based on relationships. So I think the question becomes in other international markets, whether it's Latin America or anywhere in the world, are the government programs being implemented in a way that is that is seen as sort of fair and smart and ultimately deploying capital in entrepreneurs that are sort of most deserving of it because it's not it doesn't always work that way and in, and in many cases like it doesn't work that way at all i don't know if that answered your question more or less i mean i just basically want to more more on, on, on elaboration on the fact that how to effectively build it in vietnam even in vietnam how can you effectively build an ecosystem in, in vietnam right considering it's a very different context than in dallas no no I, I think, I mean, just in, in very short, just to respond, I think it, it is this, you've got to align kind of philanthropy, broadly speaking, kind of donors, private sector and government together to kind of be working okay. off the same playbook. And that's really hard. It's not easy to do because of different interests, but theoretically, if you can pull it off. And a lot of that has to do with sort of communication and alignment of interests. Mm -hmm. um, so two of the things that were brought up is pretty important to not ecosystem are capital and mentorship and so um, like obviously you can get capital from the government but that doesn't seem very sustainable like for mentorship you can hope that there's a success story and then you'll have mentors but uh, that's also like hard to count on so what I was thinking as well an alternative is to really incentivize venture capital firms or experienced entrepreneurs who have succeeded to come to your city or your government um, so if you're if you're a government like what policy could a government take in order to attract venture capital firms and to attract people who have been successful, let's say in Silicon Valley, to come to their city, which isn't known for entrepreneurship. And you talked about what what you guys are doing in Cleveland, but um, and I know they did this in California. I don't know if they still do, but they would they, for a period of time they would let you write off any investment you made in a startup company um, as tax deductible, as you know call it a loss if it didn't work and they did that in film they did that in several areas so there's ways to do it I mean I think ultimately paying someone to be to give back to a community probably doesn't have the same results as people who are you know actively wanting to participate in it and the reality about entrepreneurship is that it's just way more fun than any other site type of business right I mean people we just have a blast we do all this crazy stuff it's sexy it's cool you know you, as I tell people all the time the first ten thousand dollars you make is more exciting than going from two million to three million dollars in sales right because it's just everything's gangbusters everything's zero to a hundred miles an hour and so I think that you know there are in, loose incentives you can do to give people and, and, and get them to engage in a deeper level but um, but in the end once somebody sort of gets access to what it's like to be in an entrepreneurial environment there's few people who don't want to participate and I think in the end it plays upon that social piece that we all have which is we all kind of really want to help other people and it's most likely that all of us at some point in our career had somebody that sat down and did something to help us whether it was to have a lunch and give us a word of advice or to introduce us to the right person or give us a certain job that we maybe didn't deserve but I think that there's that piece built within each of us that wants to give back as well but but I think the uh, suggestion is a great one it just can't be the baseline for me I can give I'm almost feeling like I'm like a spokesperson for Ohio's program <laughs> so we have a program you know to, and I actually have some money so we have something called the Ohio Capital Fund it's a hundred fifty million dollar state program um, and there's a number of aspects I'm happy to I can offline tell you more about it but um, the idea actually of it was to try to attract venture funds that aren't in the state to set up offices in the state and then they were requiring a portion of the capital um, committed from that fund to be deployed in Ohio based companies so my fund has a two million dollar investment from that fund and it's been interesting um, how it's played out 
I'm a believer in that fund. It's, it's independently managed by a third party, um, which I think is important. So they were able to sort of say, hey, we deployed in these funds for these reasons. I mean, for those of you who follow the venture capital industry, I mean, it's a total mess right now outside of some success probably on the coast. I mean, in healthcare venture capital in particular, I mean, it's a very, it's a very cold, cold winter um, right now. So um, I think it makes, you know, when you kind of look at the continuum of capital and kind of, you know, angel investing, I mean, there are these valleys of death. So I actually think some of these state <coughs> programs if structured correctly can make a big difference. There are critics who sort of say, so, you know, one of the criticisms of the, of the program in Ohio is you put an office in Ohio and, and force some commitments in the companies, but like the true um, decision makers don't sit in Ohio. So it's just kind of like a fade there to sort of setting them in office. So there's some interesting dynamics. I'm a, I'm a believer in the program. I mean, in Ohio, we sort of like tried everything. Um, the other interesting piece is like, are these things working? It's hard to tell. I mean, we were chatting before the thing started, like, you know, Research Triangle is into like their 50 year experiment here. I mean, Silicon Valley is six years. Like in Ohio, we've been doing this for 10 years. If you don't fund the Ohio capital, so the Ohio capital fund's trying to get refunded again. You can make an argument, it's like, hey, there hasn't been enough success, let's, you know, there's not enough exits, let's put a bullet in it. Well, you know, if you don't do it for another 10 years, I mean, do you sort of, you know, are you really like crippling these efforts that you've been creatively starting over 10 years if you don't continue to fund them? So the jury's out on all of our programs. I mean, let, let me twist your question slightly. I mean, the, the, the tax credit system, right, seems to be something that states have applied for years, and the jury's been out on those for, I mean, New Jersey has a, a relatively new one that's still sort of working through. We have an angel tax credit. It's interesting, and like, we, they haven't, re, they haven't re-upped it. Right. Um, and there are reasons to think that we should, and the reason, you know, it's interesting. I, I think, at the end of the day, I just see like creative approaches to this when you're in a desperate situation like Cleveland was, and arguably still is, you've got to try some different things and see what sticks. So there's, there's one, I don't, I don't have as much background in this, but I know that there's one program in Boston called Mass Challenge. And it's, an, it's, a, it's really an impressive, one of my, a couple of my friends actually got in the program, but it's really impressive, a kind of public-private partnership with the city of Boston, uh, a lot of Boston-based corporations uh, to fund uh, uh, non-dilutive grants to the winners of uh, so basically just free money mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> for colloquial speaking it's just free money uh, for and very large uh, sizable amounts for uh, the companies that um, that win uh, that are kind of top performers in this program and they let in a significant amount I mean much more than any other incubator I think that I've seen I don't even know how many they take a hundred or two hundred very large and put them in an mm -hmm. office in downtown Boston, I believe, by this by the seaport, and they have a program for four months, mm -hmm. and there's no actual requirement for these companies to settle in Boston mm -hmm. when they're done, um, but I think a lot do because it's kind of that you know they they get they just come to Boston they don't know too much about it maybe they do maybe they're from the local schools but they just stay because of mentorship because of the vibes because of the network that they build just organically right so. It's a really interesting kind of partnership that is definitely funded. Um, it's definitely uh, funded by the government um, to attract um, startups and, and businesses to stay locally. Please. Talk a little bit about the importance of uh, the, uh, the higher education institutions. Um, you know, when we think of, of Massachusetts, we think of MIT, you know, Route 128, when we think of Silicon Valley, we think of Stanford. Uh, the Research Triangle, of course, the, the three universities. Um, how important is that that grounding or that relationship between the academic institutions and the university? And to whoever. I can start. Um, critical. I mean, at a high level. I mean, and 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 in Cleveland, it's it's the healthcare institutions. As an institution, and it's the universities as institutions. And both is research. Uh, both research. both have significant research. So, like my home university, Case Western Reserve, has four hundred million dollars in sort of federal funding, and I think it's pretty clear that if you've got a pipeline of kind of traditional research, those um, you know patents get filed, and sort of like commercializing that research out of that funnel um, is important. But we, as a state, have actually put money. Um, into different programs to try to take advantage of that translation, that commercialization piece. And I think many tech, and we were having a conversation about technology transfer offices um, before actually Jim and I were talking about it. 
Um, it's, I think it's easier for traditional technology transfer offices to get excited about licensing out technology. It's less risky. So let's take a piece of great research, right? License it out, and you know, for a royalty stream <coughs> down the road, this whole idea of backing, you know, spinning technologies out into companies. Not every institution has a tremendous amount of comfort with that, and I think it's growing. It sounds like Princeton's doing a really good job of that. Um, this whole student-initiated entrepreneurship is a whole nother area. Sometimes they're tapping into the technology transfer organizations, but more often than not, and you know, whether it's Stanford or Princeton people, if they're not developing that research in the labs, they're sort of they're leveraging things like the Keller Center and other things, and going outside of. Uh, of, of the technology transfer. So I mean, I think the short answer is it's it's critical and in each case it's gonna be sort of applied differently. Both Michael and Trey talked a little bit about what sounded to me like perhaps philosophical or cultural challenges with getting people in Vietnam and Dallas to sort of embrace entrepreneurship in different fields, right? Dallas being a little more traditional and big corporations, oil, lot of finance and particular commodities and such. Bringing that back to social entrepreneurship, which is still sort of new-ish, what do you guys see the temperature of, the, of the interest in those fields? So Warby <coughs> is a great example. They're doing great things. They, they were very quickly successful. Tom Shoes is another one. Uh, but that, that area I find particularly interesting or particularly challenging. Investors want to hear that you're going to make money. and. Most investors are going to be more and more concerned, I would think, with being able to make clear profits, not necessarily the social responsibility aspect. But I would love to know that I'm wrong, hmm. and I'd love to hear your input. I mean, it depends on the investor you're going after. We're working on a project in Dallas right now called uh, On the Road, and it is giving loans to uh, people with subprime credit so that they can get cars, so they can get to work. Um, and the model that's really interesting starts with a much higher interest rate, obviously, because they have subprime credit. But as they pay that loan back, the interest rate goes down. Mm. And so what you're doing there is if you start, you know, payday loan stuff that they have is, what, 28% or mm. in addition to that. So if you start a loan at 16% and let it go all the way down to 5%, your average return is 10%, which is a pretty good return. Um, on investment, especially when you have a high return rate on the the money you're giving, so I think I think you have to find the right investor for things like that. Um, I think that uh, I think that the, some of the things that the Treasury Department are doing with foundations, whereby allowing that five percent of mandatory um, money that has to go to nonprofits actually go to for profits as long as it's in line with your mission, is something that is an incentive that's giving people a reason to. Um, put money into for-profit related social businesses or social enterprises. So, I mean, I think that uh, on the other side, I would say the difference between I'm on the board of a, a international nonprofit microfinance company, and there's lots of for-profit microfinance companies. I don't think there is any problem with people making money on helping people. Now, gouging them is something different, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's what a lot of these organizations are built upon. So. Um, I think they're, I think the profit models in these sort of social injustices or social good areas are actually really healthy, solid, um, in some in some cases less risky than um, even investing in startup companies. So I'll point to two organizations that you might want to look at um, or foundations. Um, one, Pierre Omidyar, who's the eBay founder, has set up something called the Omidyar Network. Mm -hmm. If you go to their website, it's really interesting. They are both sort of from an NGO point of view, sort of so from a foundation point of view, supporting nonprofit organizations that I mean, they're sort of focused on high impact entrepreneurship overseas. But they're actually on the on the investment side on the for profit ledger, they're actually supporting social businesses. Um, and you can kind of click on their website. I mean, it's like these are the nonprofits and these are the for profits. So they're actually sort of like putting their money where their mouth is now. They're an Acumen, which is a New York based organization. Um, I think Brian Trollstad has been involved. Um, here, so Acumen, you know, they call it patient capital, um, and I know like Brian's a former McKinsey because I mean they have some really elegant graphs that actually don't have anything to do from a time. The reality for venture capital is our time horizon on exits has been pushed way out because of the markets. So um, Acumen has this really elegant graph of like 
you know, philanthropy on one axis, you sort of are just giving money, you don't care about the returns. Venture capital, you know, without kind of social interest, you know, all you care about is our returns. And then there's something that they call patient capital, which is kind of in the middle. And they're saying, hey, you know, the, the return horizon, the ROI may be lower than a traditional investment. And I think it's a really interesting approach. So they're putting their money where their mouth is, you know, in, in markets around the world. So I'm, I'm intrigued by what they're doing. So I, th I think it actually is happening. We have time for one more quick question. Uh, so you guys broadly defined your, I mean, you got a general idea about what an entrepreneurial ecosystem is and how they vary based on where you are in different cities and whatnot. But uh, I have a couple of questions. I'm a first year grad student in engineering and within the past six months to one year I've been getting really interested in the entrepreneurial and business side of things. And one of the questions it, that I have is, mm, how do I break into this ecosystem? Um, for example, I'm here at Princeton, um, and even if I wasn't even here at Princeton, how would one break into the ecosystem? Um, so I'm young, I have ideas, but I have no money. I'm a first year grad student. Um, and I've been reading angel investors aren't really funding too many ideas at the moment. So it seems kind of difficult for one to get their, their ideas out there. Um, so that's my one of my, my biggest questions. I mean, I grew up, 15 minutes away from New York City. I've been to New York City a whole bunch of times, but I mean, if I, if I wasn't here at these kinds of things, or, or if I wasn't even right here at Princeton, I would have no, at least, way to meet you guys or to get involved in these kinds of things, but I want to. So how would you break into that? Well, one of the great things about entrepreneurial ecosystems is that they're very inclusive. Right, so you search up, you find a meetup, you find an event like this, you find out something cool that's going on in New York, and you show up. Um, they're not going to shun you. They're going to invite you in. They're going to ask you questions. And what I tell people in Dallas, I mean, it's like any industry. It's really small when you get into it. So the ecosystem, although it's big in in New York, the people are really active in a consistent basis in it. Some of the leaders are going to be consistent. So once you start to go to these things again and get involved and just be present, your opportunities are going to come from that. You're going to meet people that, you know, through the networking that puts you in touch with somebody who has the, has done something like what you're thinking or has a similar interest or in some cases just as powerful somebody who has a different skill set than you that is passionate about the same things because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take three engineers to build a company or three business guys or whatnot. It takes, it takes a lot of different skills and talents. So, you know, part of it is diving into it. The good thing is that traditionally they're very welcoming of new people. So, I mean, that's a simple answer. I don't yeah, no, I, I think the, for me, I think the most important thing is is being specific and kind of what you want to do, right? So it's not just, I want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> I want to join an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, I should drop by the Keller Center and talk to people. I think it's it's more about, really think about what you want to do. What are you passionate about? What, what specifically do you want to build? And start, like not, you can, you can do very easy things like put up a website, start talking to people, start even sending an email out to the alumni listserv, or, or you have this whole university to, as a testing ground for all your ideas and for very little money, free, really. That's where Learn CS 101 came from. I literally just sent out an email to the alumni listserv that, hey, who wants to take a class with other people um, uh, online and we'll meet once a week. So it's like, literally the cost of some of these experiments that you can have and just really start testing your ideas, uh, they're innumerable, these opportunities. And once you, you'll quickly find people gravitate towards you once you kind of throw an idea out on the table and start asking questions, who's in, who's out. You'll, you'll, you'll feel that, it, don't, don't be afraid to just ask and, and throw out ideas and, and it'll, it'll happen. People Take come advantage of the fact that you are a student. I tell my students all the time, People like it when students show initiative. They think it's, you know, extra impressive because you're young, right? But the problem is as soon as you graduate, you're just like me, you just don't know anything, right? So right now it's cute and fun and cool because you're a student and you're, you know, you're trying to uh, enlarge your horizons and meet new people and show initiative and that's great. And then when you graduate, you're just another person looking for a job. So really take advantage of the opportunities, like Wayne was saying, that you can get being a student and having that next to your name versus it becomes a little bit harder once you're finished. I think the LinkedIn as a tool, yeah. um, 
for folks to utilize today. I mean, we didn't have it when I was I mean, it's the ability to, I mean, you should connect with all of us on LinkedIn and then you start seeing who we're connected to. Um, that's, I talk to my students about that all the time. I mean, it's such a powerful thing of like, you know, I mean, we just met and it's like, you start to build things and it's like, then I sort of go in and it's like, oh, I didn't know you. I mean, I find that using LinkedIn and then seeing what mutual connections you have with people is such an interesting tool um, to kind of quickly accelerate the networking process. So I definitely would highly encourage you. I'd love if you ask me to link in with you. Say yes and you can see who I'm connected to. I think that's a one final question. No, okay. I, I'm not gonna stand in the way of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, nice. well, gentlemen, let, let me say, as, uh, <laughs> as a lawyer who gets the, the, the good fortune to sit and chat with you gentlemen and others like you, it was uh, incredibly impressive. I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience did as well. And, and thank you very much.